So let's, uh, I, I want to introduce uh, two more measures, uh, namely rank correlation coefi coefficients. On the one hand, uh, the Spearman correlation coefficient, which is the, the normal or Pearson correlation coefficient. However, not between the original uh, ver observations or variables, but between the separately ranked observations. So for, uh, for each uh, set of observations, you rank them individually and then compare these uh, rank orders and you thus obtain a coefficient which, oppo as opposed to the Pearson one, is invariant under any strictly Um, monotonous uh, transformation uh, ranked observations So, for example, you can take uh, the log or the square root or the exponent, uh, exponential of one of uh, the random variables, and this will not change uh, the order of the random variables and will hence not change the Spearman correlation coefficient. And then there is the Kendall tau rank correlation coefficient. So what you do here is you count the number of concordant and discordant pairs of, of observations, and I will say in a minute what this is. Concordant, as a concordant, on discordant and you divide by the total number of pairs and uh, thus get out something which also is between minus one and plus one and now I should say what concordant and discordant means so uh, If you have a pair x i y i and x j y j of observations, then these are called concordant or in agreement if either xi is greater than xj and yi is greater than yj or vice versa if xi is smaller than xj and yi is smaller than yj and uh, they're called discordant otherwise.
I can spell out otherwise. So if xi is larger than xj and yi is smaller than yj, or you can imagine uh, the alternative. And again, this is invariant with respect to rank preserving transformations. Okay, so and here we are in the yeah 1930s. This is when Kendall's tau was proposed, and then uh, in the yeah go ahead. Uh, any transformation of the values which does not change the order if you sort by size. Invariant with respect to rank preserving transformations. And, and I copied for you. Uh, a discussion of an article. So the uh, Annals of Applied Statistics are nice in that, uh, so this is uh, for those, yeah, sorry, it's very small. It's uh, Annals of Applied Statistics, uh, 2009, volume three, pages 1233 and following. And the Annals of Applied Statistics are nice because whenever there's an important article, then they invite uh, authors to discuss this article. And uh, sometimes they invite friends and sometimes they invite enemies. Uh, but in each case, it's usually interesting to read. And then at the end, there's a response of uh, the authors. And generally, these discussions, they try to point out some weakness and then introduce a clever thought of their own and uh, generally leave a knowledgeable impression. So uh, it's uh, actually, it's, it's quite fun to read these discussions. And uh, here's a discussion that very, very nicely summarizes the contents of the paper. Uh, so a discussion by Michael Newton, uh, who said, who, who writes that he recalls this great sense of excitement when he first heard uh, the talk by Professor Schickele, where he was talking about his distance covariance. And then he goes on to say that uh, so why was there so much excitement? Simply because all the normal, well, because the the normal uh, co coefficient that we've just been discussing, uh, because they have all these known uh, limitations and have been around for so long. And uh, this one now, this correlation coefficient, this one can capture non-linear associations between random variables. And moreover, it satisfies Don Geeman's elevator test. Uh, the method must be simple enough so you can explain it in the time uh, that you're in the elevator without it being stuck. Uh, so um, actually, the, this discussion is much easier to read than the paper itself. Um, this is why I've copied the discussion for you. Uh, and the recipe is here. Uh, you take, you so you look at one random variable first, and you compute all pairwise distances between all the samples from this one random variable, and you do the same for the other. So you get out two distance matrices, and these distance matrices are then centered with this nice centering operator that we've discussed last hour. So centered, so that each column and row uh, gets a zero mean. And you then take the element-wise product of these two matrices and uh, compute the average size of that element-wise product. And uh, remarkably, uh, this works if the individual, if these random entities that you compare, if they're of different dimension, you must only be able to compute the distance between uh, the different samples. 
and uh, you know this is not just a uh, uh, not just an engineered thing which is easy to compute but it actually relates to deeper concepts on the one hand uh, the Pearson correlation emerges as a special case and uh, the Brownian motion covariance emerges as another special case. It has something to do with stochastic processes. And uh, I will show you in, in pictures what it can do. So this is also a picture from uh, the same discussion paper. Uh, these are the same examples that you saw in the previous slide. And you find, you see that the Pearson correlation of all these examples is practically zero. It's not exactly zero because you're looking at a finite number of points, so y there's always a little bit of chance correlation, but these numbers are roughly zero. Even though uh, there's clearly um, a lot of structure in these uh, bivariate distributions. So this is not a random blob. You can see there's a sinusoid hidden here, or there's a half moon here, and there's something like an X here, or there's a disk there. Uh, and there are the values that you compute with the recipe that you know he describes to you in, in those two lines from the paper. Uh, there are the values for the distance correlation that uh, happen to scale between zero and between zero and one. And the important thing is that here we get uh, significantly non-zero values everywhere except in the last example where you expect a zero because uh, because this really uh, here x and y are independent so that's what it can do for you and now uh, I'm not going to give proofs but let's look a little bit at, uh, at the math uh, behind this go ahead Um, I don't have an intuitive explanation. Uh, it it measures how far, so it takes the marginals and builds the product of the marginals. And in a truly independent case, uh, you would get out the same uh, distribution back again. And in this case, you measure the deviation of the product of the marginals from the uh, original distribution. However, you don't do it in the original space, but in the Fourier space. And moreover, you weight with some funny function. And uh, the funny function is not arbitrary, but you have to pick this one to get out the nice theoretical properties. So uh, uh, it's, uh, I wouldn't claim uh, I can intuitively uh, you know, explain why one number is bigger than the other. No, um, the funny function is, uh, you know, I will tell you it's something with the volume of a hypersphere, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, in the original paper, he argues why this function is the right one. Um, but uh, he actually studies a whole family of such functions and then says that this one has the desirable properties of uh, scaling in the correct range and so on. Um, so uh, I must refer you to the original paper if you really want to hear his arguments. Yeah, it's essentially a, a low-pass uh, weighting. So you, you, uh, the, the low-pass weighting, again, if you talk about it in real space, means you care more about getting the rough features right rather than you know, the, the fine noise. So these entities they have been uh, advertised under a number of names, but uh, apparently the ones that are going to stick are distance covariance and distance correlation. And uh, this is, there are two papers on this. There's one by Shikely and co-authors in 2007 in the Annals of Statistics. 
And then again, Shikili and, and Rizzo in 2009 in the Annals of Applied Statistics. This is the paper from uh, the discussion of which I have copied uh, this article. So interesting properties are that the distance correlation, which he calls R, of two random variables x and y is defined for x and y of arbitrary and even different or you know pot possibly different dimensions this correlation becomes zero if and only if x and y are independent. It becomes one if there is a close functional association, so uh, I'm writing hand-wavingly, at least if y equals a plus b times x multiplied with uh, o, where o is an orthogonal matrix. So o transpose o should be the identity matrix. And it does not take negative values. So it just tells you, is there a correlation or not? It scales between 0 and 1. Now here is uh, just a gist of the theoretical argument. So in general, x and y are independent exactly if uh, the, the joint distribution <coughs> is the product of the marginals. And <coughs> uh, we can now take the Fourier transform of this to obtain the so-called characteristic function. And that is, by the way, often done in statistics because uh, it's sometimes easier to derive an analytic form for density in Fourier space that has to do with the following fact. If you sum up random variables, you have to convolve their densities. And as you know, in Fourier space, a convolution becomes multiplication. So it becomes easier to represent uh, the density that results from an addition of random variables, it's easier to argue that sort of thing in Fourier space. And the Fourier transform of a probability density function is called the characteristic function. So it's the Fourier transform of a probability density function. And again, x and y are independent if and only if the joint characteristic is a product of the marginal characteristic functions. And the following measure of dependence, I think, makes uh, sense intuitively, namely to compute, uh, given some weight function, uh, the norm of the deviation. Yeah, so we look at the joint characteristic function minus the product of the marginals. And this with respect to some weight function. So W is. And the magic now resides 
in the choice of this weighting function. So the weight function uh, that he proposes to use is, uh, is the following. I first write down the empirical distance covariance So this is the Fourier transform of n points, and this Fourier transform has uh, two dimensions. Yeah? So, so here they're called t and s rather than x and y. And the weight function that he proposes in Fourier space is the following. This is the product of two constants times the absolute value of t times the absolute value of s taken to those powers. And cp and cq, this is half the surface of the unit sphere in uh, p or q dimensions. So in this weighting function here, uh, it diverges at the origin and and uh, Schickele and his colleagues argue uh, that it is vital that they do. So if you use normal integrable weight functions, you don't get out the favorable properties. And using this funny weight function, um, or rather using this particular weight function, uh, they, they prove in a theorem that this translates to the algorithm that passes the Gieman elevator test. Okay, so the, uh, the theorem which is perhaps uh, at the heart of this paper. Yeah. No, it's uh, this is the dimensional t of the random variables. So uh, they have p and q dimensions. Sorry. So the theorem says that the empirical distance covariance, which is derived in uh, which is derived in Fourier space using this funny weight function here, can be calculated simply as follows. So here is the uh, centered distance matrix. I'm not sure what I should call it. I, I've used an S, but it's not the scatter matrix, okay? This is the centered distance matrix of the variable X. And the centered distance matrix of the variable Y. And here the element-wise product of these center distance matrices is taken and normalized by the uh, total number of entries. And again, S is not the scatter matrix, but it is now C, D, X, C, where C is the centering matrix that we've seen earlier today. And 
the distance matrix which is being centered here element KL of this distance matrix is simply the Euclidean distance of two random samples. Perhaps I should have started the other way around. Okay, So what we do is um, we have two random variables x and y. We compute for each pair of random variables x uh, their distance. We do the same uh, for the random variable y. So that's similarly defined. Then we center both. So centering this one such that it has a row and column mean of zero gives Sx, whereas uh, this thing after centering gives Sy. And then we take the element wise product of these matrices. So taking the element wise product could be written differently here as Sx, if you like fancy notation. This would be the element wise product. And I need to sum uh, the summation. I could also write by multiplying with a row and a column vector of ones. And then I need to normalize by the number of entries. And that gives me my empirical distance covariance. And this, by the theorem that they prove, is the same thing as computing this measure of uh, dependence here in, in Fourier space. You have a question? Ah, um, the why do I use the subscript N on the empirical distance covariance? Okay, yeah, well, for the, uh, because it's an empirical estimate, so for the F, it makes sense to say, you know, this is a Fourier series, and from how many points was it actually computed? Uh, if you put it on the new or not, let's say that this reminds us of the fact that this is really the empirical estimate from n observations or n pairs of observations only. Uh, an alternative notation, I think, would be uh, to omit the n and put a hat on there. No, they're continuous. So this is, uh, you know, if you talk about Fourier space as K space, then I would call it K. But here it's been called T and S, but it's, it's the same thing. Uh, no, it's, it's not a discrete Fourier transform. Um, so what, what you have is let me think. Um, so it's not a discrete Fourier transform because you have just this discrete set of points and they do not, they're not tiled in space, they do not repeat. So your Fourier transform is indeed a continuous function here. Uh, yeah, well, the, the point is that it doesn't make sense to do it in Fourier space. You you actually do it in using this formula that I've, you know, that, that the theorem shows is equivalent. But conceptually, what you would do is that, uh, you know, you compute all these continuous functions and then you integrate over all of Fourier space these continuous functions with this uh, weighted with this uh, function w, and the, you know if if it if that was the end of the story, it would be a, an unusable thing uh, because nobody you know would want to do this uh, integration. But the amazing thing is that the theorem shows that it is the same as uh, you know doing this uh, four-line uh, calculation here. And that's now totally feasible because it, this is entirely in the discrete domain. And I cannot claim, so I've not even tried to understand the theorem, yeah, so this is really complicated stuff, but the nice thing is that it apparently holds. 
and well we will see you know if this gets uh, taken up uh, or not um, there has been uh, I think a year ago uh, th there was an article in science with uh, even you know an extra note about it where people have claimed to have written uh, or to have developed an even nicer uh, covariance function and uh, I will try if I can if I can find this for you uh, yeah so um, there's this uh, science article uh, and this so so what these authors propose uh, has very favorable properties too um, but this is an extremely heavy computational procedure so this is something uh, so the distance covariance is something that that you could in principle compute by hand if you had to this thing is totally impossible to do by hand so it's, it uses a combinatorial algorithm and uh, so this must use a computer and it's I, I don't find the numbers that come out here very intuitive either however this is also a good measure for general association between random variables so it's interesting that the the field has lain has laid dormant for for 50 60 years so people in the background had been working on this but nobody noticed that they did anything or nobody believed that it was something worthwhile and now after 60 years that's interesting huh? so something has happened again so like a wildfire that has popped up again so I, I find it interesting that uh, you know I also thought you know this field okay we have Pearson and Kendall and, and, and all that and that's fine and we're done and uh, it's interesting that these association measures now have come up recently okay uh, one last word if um, uh, I think we still have to see um, so I think right now this is also why I'm stressing it so much it's not so widely known yet so uh, you know this was published the ones that I've talked about they were published in 2009 um, Tillman Gneiting a statistician uh, here from Heidelberg has alerted us to this us being the members of a research training group on probabilistic graphical models and uh, I this is why I'm talking about here because you are the next generation of scientists so um, uh, we will we will see you know how heavily it becomes cited but uh, I think it's I think it's up to you and uh, it's also up to you to you know come to an opinion of yourself if you like the algorithm better that I presented or the one that I'm currently uh, that I'm projecting here um, you know this is good work but I even prefer the uh, the other one that I've talked about uh, at great length yeah and we will see you know if, if this is a if this is a breakthrough if people will, will really use it or not uh, one final thing I meant to say here is that uh, if you don't use this uh, fancy weight function but if you simply use a weight function of one then the distance covariance becomes the absolute value of the standard Pearson covariance so there's the relation to the classical work I have a comment about the Mandas distance uh, that uh, was just mentioned. The Mandas coefficient is that where R and G are the intensities of the red and the green color channel at pixel number I in an image. So you, you sum across uh, all pixels in an image, multiply the red and green intensity and divide by either uh, the uh, sum of the red squared or by the sum of the green squared uh, and this is to avoid bias in the one or the other direction if either the red or the green channel is, is very dominant and as such um, this is more an example of a uh, histogram distance perhaps distance is not a good word because if the this becomes if you if you think of two histograms it becomes maximal if they are very similar but uh, but overall um, this is one of a large set of uh, histogram similarities or dissimilarities that have been proposed. Um, 
certainly this one is useful for the particular application where you want to uh, establish uh, how many dots that are visible, some are only visible in the red, others are only visible in the green channel, uh, how many of them are close together, so how many of them are co-localized. Uh, but I wanted to give you uh, a hint to other literature on the subject, independent of co-localization, uh, in particular uh, a paper that I think is uh, very useful. This is from uh, uh, Pele and Wehrmann, uh, 2010. And the best known distance that is used for histograms uh, is probably this one here. It's the chi-squared statistic. I it's very cheap to compute. So you sum over all histogram bins, and uh, you I see a few nodes there. So I think some of you have seen this. So you take the difference squared, and you divide by the sum. And then there are other distances that are more expensive to compute and that we will also talk about in the semester later on, the earth movers distance in particular. And then um, they show, uh, they use a different uh, distance here and show empirically that it improves performance on, on a number of benchmarks that they study. Okay, so this was a postscript on the Mander coefficient uh, that I had not previously heard of. Okay. So, uh, I will start with a one-page reminder of things that you will know.